Okay, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, today at Google, we're delighted to have Mr. Scott Hartley. Uh, Mr. Hartley is a venture capitalist and an author. Um, he is a, or he was a partner at uh, Moore David Dow Ventures, a very highly regarded venture capital firm based out of Sand Hill Road. Um, and prior to that, he was a presidential innovation fellow at the White House. Um, he has also worked at Google, Facebook, and a, he was a fellow at the Harvard's Berkman Center for uh, Internet and Society. Uh, he, took his Stanford, uh, he took his BA from Stanford and his MBA from Columbia, and he is a term member on the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he's here today to discuss his new book, The Fuzzy and the Techie, Why Liberal Arts um, Will Rule the Digital World. Uh, and joining him on stage is uh, Google's very own Albert Chen. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Scott Hartley. So welcome, Scott, or I should say welcome back. Um, so Thank tell you. me, let's start with the in inspiration behind the book and what a fuzzy is and what a techie is as well. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be back on Google campus about 10 years or so after leaving. Albert and I go way back uh, 12 plus years uh, here at Google, so it's really uh, it's really fun to be back and to join all of you guys. Um, so the the impetus for writing the book, uh, the fuzzy and the techie, was really based on uh, my experience, uh, both in my own sort of personal journey, uh, being a political science major, being somebody who studied political theory, definitely identifying as a fuzzy, yet kind of coming out of school and joining Google, um, and having all my friends say, well, you know, what are you doing at Google? How are you working in in tech? Um, and I think you know this has become something that. Uh, People, people understand more today, but you know, 10, 12 years ago, I felt like all of my friends coming out of, out of university, uh, you know, if they didn't study electrical engineering or computer science, they didn't understand that there were other people in tech and that it wasn't just this monolith of, of techies. And so uh, kind of based on my own personal journey of, of being this, uh, you know, presumed to be this black sheep when I didn't feel like a black sheep, I felt like there were so many people in this world that were participating from all different walks of life, all different sides of, of, of academic background. Um, I wanted to, to kind of tell that story that was sort of a myth-busting of the sort of tech monolith that we presume to be Silicon Valley. Um, and the second reason was because uh, on Sand Hill, where I was uh, in VC, um, so many of the companies that were pitching, so many of the companies that were starting um, were founded by people that were coming from all these different backgrounds. And I thought, you know, the narrative in Silicon Valley, the narrative uh, that we hear about in the media has been, you know, if you don't have a STEM degree, you're worthless if you don't if you didn't drop out of middle school, you know, to study computer science. There's no hope for you in the future. And the the actual um, observation I had, kind of the empirical observation, sitting on Sand Hill and meeting with all these different entrepreneurs, all these different companies, was, you know, so many of the great ideas were coming from people that came out of different walks of life, different backgrounds, different disciplines, um, different sort of passions. And the observation was that. The, the code in some ways had been commoditized and the ability to, to get things built, um, you know, we were getting farther and farther away, you know, more and more abstractions away from having to write, you know, really uh, esoteric syntax or really kind of learning the, the details or nuance of certain, certain coding languages, you know, we were getting these like bigger and bigger building blocks. And, you know, the, so the code in some ways had been commoditized and really the comparative advantage of these really good companies was somebody with passion, somebody with a domain expertise, somebody with some sort of other disciplinary knowledge that they were, you know, to which they were applying the code. And so, you know, that was kind of the impetus for writing the book was kind of myth bust this narrative that um, so many of the interesting companies that we were meeting with and funding and that are profiled in the book um, were you know, founded by people coming out of backgrounds in philosophy, backgrounds in sociology, backgrounds in political science, um, coming out of fashion or media or finance or telecom, you know, all these different backgrounds. And, um, and so the terms, you know, fuzzy and techie, I don't know, is anyone in the room familiar with these terms? No. So they date back to the 1960s, 1970s uh, from Stanford where uh, there was kind of this lighthearted uh, association where people would ask the question, and they, and they still do, um, you know, are you more of a fuzzy, are you more of a techie? Do you, are you taking more fuzzy classes this quarter, more techie classes? And, uh, you know, obviously techie uh, being kind of computer science, engineering disciplines, uh, fuzzy being more arts, humanities, and social sciences. Um, but really, you know, the book is not about sort of one versus the other, fuzzy versus techie. It's about this sort of intertwining of the two. Um, because I think, you know, you look under the hood of any of these disciplines, any of these methodologies, 
And uh, you know, if you're studying social science, you're often sort of fo forced to grapple with statistical software or you know, deal with independent and dependent variables. If you're studying international relations, you're dealing with game theory. And um, you know, if, you're, if you're studying mechanical engineering on the flip side, you're learning design thinking. You're using sort of methodologies of sociology and anthropology to do user experience research. So I think it's, you know, it's not that we can say you know, one group is uniformly techy and one group is uniformly fuzzy. It's much more about sort of how we blend these two sides and how so many of the innovations that I think make Google successful, make so many of great startups in Silicon Valley successful is actually this blending of the two rather than sort of this narrative of you know, tech is going to solve all, uh, big data, algorithms, AI, every, you know, this sort of uniformly techy explanation is going to solve all. Thank you. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So let's start with one of those themes and closer to home for Google. Um, in the book, you talk a lot about big data and that need for human input to inform things, um, including a company called Kaggle, which is now a part of Google. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, Kaggle, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Kaggle. Um, it was founded by an Australian economist. Uh, it's basically a platform where you can put uh, big data uh, to work and then crowdsource different explanations, uh, different sort of uh, observations on the data. And so companies can post uh, public or proprietary data sets kind of behind an NDA, behind a non-disclosure agreement. Um, and really, you get this diverse set of people kind of looking at the data, um, trying to find whatever answer you're, you're seeking. And so. It's a competition platform, which was acquired, I believe, in March. Uh, is now part of Google Cloud. Um, but Anthony Goldblum, um, you know, he really had this observation uh, while he was working for The Economist, actually, uh, that uh, there was all this really fascinating data that was locked up, siloed within companies. And he said, you know, why can't we crowdsource? Why can't we bring sort of the wealth of global expertise against this data? And there are these really fascinating, if you look through the case studies uh, of Kaggle, um, where, for example, um, the Royal Astronomical Society and NASA and the European Space Agency were trying to quantify dark matter in the universe. And they had you know, been working on this for a decade. And they released this, uh, this data set, and they found that uh, it was a glaciologist, actually, from the UK, who was using algorithms that were looking at sort of measuring the edge of a glacier from space imagery that he was able to quantify, he was able to use some of those tactics kind of orthogonally from this completely different domain uh, in, in this sort of uh, explanation of, of trying to quantify dark matter. And he got closer to the approximations that NASA and these, uh, you know, these cosmologists had been working on for a decade in a matter of weeks. And I think it's a really incredible example of kind of putting sort of uh, you know, other human expertise in the mix with big data um, you know, another example in the book is, uh, is Palantir, which is down the street, you know, in, in Palo Alto and, and now around the world. And, you know, Palantir is a big data company that we forget is run by a guy named Alex Karp, who has a PhD in neoclassical social theory and was also co-founded by Peter Thiel, who has a degree in philosophy and law. Um, so it's a big data company, but, you know, one of the, one of the guys uh, who's a director at, at Palantir, he, he has a TED Talk, a guy named Sham Sankar, and he talks about how there's... There's no terrorist find button. So for anyone familiar with Palantir, it's, you know, it's a big data science company, but there are these huge sort of human components behind the scenes. Uh, so uh, you know, when, when you think, OK, you collect the, uh, the data from you know, a bunch of three-letter agencies, from you know, FBI and from, from different groups, and you think, well, if we just kind of plug all this data together, suddenly big data is going to have all these answers, we forget that, you know, uh, Voltaire said, you know, judge a man by his questions, not by his answers. And I think we still require smart questioners kind of sitting in front of this, uh, you know, new, newly surfaced data in, in, you know, in interesting new ways. But um, in the case of Palantir, it really requires, you know, the battlefield commander, the intelligence officer, the people that are transcribing uh, data and, you know, codifying it in certain ways, putting it into the system in certain ways, you know, picking the taxonomy of how they look at the data. Um, so we forget that you know behind these buzzwords um, that from a VC standpoint, you know we love to see them on slide decks, but at some point you got to take a step back and you say, well, is every company that we see a big data company? Is you know is every company we see an, an artificial intelligence company? Not really. Um, it's really kind of about this blending of of human and, and data, human and machine. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Um, one of the thing, other things you touched on is uh, automation and like the concept of algorithms and. Those are some examples. The example used in the book is Stitch Fix, which uh -huh. is what uh, you know, I think it's cool. How does that apply to fashion? And 
Why is that a great example? Yeah. Well, I, th I think you're much more fashion fashionable up here than, than I am. But Stitch Fix, uh, I don't know, is anyone familiar with Stitch Fix? Uh, yeah, a few, a few a hands in the audience. They just rolled out uh, the men's clothing uh, recently, but uh, it's, it's been in the market for, for women's clothing for a few years. Um, but Stitch Fix is a, is a fascinating example because uh, really, you know, it's sort of Netflix for fashion. So what they've done is they've taken uh, articles of clothing, they've employed, you know, different people from, from fashion backgrounds, from style backgrounds, where they are able to classify the clothing according to 100, 150 characteristics. So whether it's, you know, the width of the lapel or, you know, the style of button, all these different characteristics, they, you know, they start identifying what clothing, uh, you know, wh where it fits. And then through connecting like Pinterest APIs, through uh, queries uh, and sort of polling of, of your style habits, they're able to start matching what your preferences might be for a certain type of fa fashion with the characteristics uh, inherent in certain clothing items that you pick. And over time, they're developing this Netflix-like algorithm to better surface clothing to you in a, in a really automated, streamlined way. Um, but what's fascinating about Stitch Fix is, I mean, one, it was founded by uh, Katrina Lake, who you know, is an economics major, uh, not, not deeply technical. Um, she, uh, she had a vision, though, and she had this passion to want to solve this problem. She said, you know, I, she was working in, in retail consulting, didn't have any time to shop for herself, uh, didn't have sort of the, uh, the, the time to do it on her own. And she said, you know, why is it that I can sit down and have all of my content served to me via Netflix, but I can't have you know, certain uh, e-commerce items served to me in the time and fashion that I, that I want to receive them? And so she realized that this was uh, you know, heavy logistics operation. It's going to require a lot of SKUs and a lot of clothing items moving you know, around. Uh, so she said, well, you know, who's good at logistics? She said, well, you know, Walmart's good at logistics. Why don't I go try to hire the COO of Walmart? And so she went and found CEO of Walmart.com, got him to quit his job, worked for her when she was still in the dorm room. And uh, you know, that kind of grit, that kind of passion to be able to convince and sort of tell the story uh, is, is you know, so much more important in some ways than um, the ability to actually code the product, right? It was that ability to tell the story, ability to tell the narrative, uh, to convince somebody to leave a job as CEO of Walmart.com. And she not only did that, but then she went to, uh, she said, well, if this is Netflix, um, we need somebody who's really good at data science. Uh, so why not go get the guy who built Netflix uh, algorithms? His name's Eric Coulson. So she went and pr approached Eric and was able to convince Eric to leave his job uh, as the sort of chief data scientist uh, at Netflix who had built the whole team to build the algorithms uh, that, that run sort of how Netflix provides uh, its, uh, its movies. And so through this uh, combination, she was able to build this, uh, this killer team around her. Um, but you know, the most interesting thing, I think, in, in to your question is uh, Eric is somebody that, even though he's a data scientist, even though he's you know, a huge believer in, in the tech behind the scenes, he's also a huge believer in, in the human. And so he, he basically talks about how he has his M algorithm for machine, and he has his H algorithm for his humans. And he's got about 70 or 80 data scientists on his team but they've got about 4,000 stylists that do all the end delivery of the product. And so I think you know, when we take a step back from this assumption kind of in the 140 character Twitter universe of reading headlines and seeing you know, AI and automation are taking everything over, and we forget that behind the 60 or 80 data scientists or 4,000 stylists um, really sort of looking at the nuance of you know, geography and, and sort of your own fashion sense, um, the machine algorithm is serving them a subset of items that they think will be pretty relevant to you. But then the last mile delivery is all based on you know, who you are, what you say you like, um, your personality and our like, actual interactions. Um, there's, there's really this last mile human delivery. Um, and you know, one of the most fascinating things about that is it's, it's not treating the human as uh, problematic, but it's using machine learning to try to use the, the human as a, as a classification problem. So if I have my own biases in how I serve clothing to you that you either accept or, or don't accept, um, you know, we can use the machine learning to actually mitigate my own biases and how you know, if I'm based in Brooklyn or I'm based in uh, Des Moines, you know, I might have a different sense of what's fashion forward or what's hipster or what's you know, one of these classifications. Um, so the machine learning can actually help me perform better as a human stylist. Uh, so I think it's a really fascinating example of, you know, not sort of the primacy of 
I, you know, it's not the Luddite uh, no technology, and it's not sort of the primacy of techie-only solutions, but it's really about kind of blending these two sides. Um, so, the, uh, you know, Stitch Fix is uh, something that I think is a, a great example of that. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, I want to dive into one of the things you mentioned, so um, about automation, about tasks moving away from humans. So mm -hmm. depending on what you read, anywhere between like a third up to close to 50% of American jobs, quote unquote, yeah. are at risk due to automation and machines. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I mean, back to the question about uh, like the reason for writing the book. Yeah. I really felt like the, the narrative and the pendulum of you know, Martin Ford's Rise, Rise of the Robots was a great book. I don't know if anyone's read that. Um, but you know, the, this sort of message of fear and uh, the narrative of fear, and I thought you know, the pendulum has got to come back toward hope, because I, I, don't, I don't agree with, with the sort of 50% of all jobs are disappearing sure. tomorrow. And uh, you know that in that quote, it really refers to this study in 2014. Oxford came out with a study where uh, they said 47% of U.S. Uh, jobs are at high risk of machine automation. You know, it didn't really define sort of what, on what timeline. Uh, you know, technological ability is not the same thing as uh, immediately substituting for jobs tomorrow. Obviously, there's you know, there's an economic question, there's a labor question, there's a flexibility of labor question. There's all these other components to that. Uh, so more recently in January, um, McKinsey Global Institute came out with a study that kind of you know hit pause and said, let's take a step back, and let's you know let's look at this 47% number and let's think about this. And so they they looked at 800 different occupations across the U.S. and they broke up those occupations into the tasks that make up those jobs because you know like we all know you know any job you've got 100 different tasks that you do on a daily basis. And some of those things are best practices. Some of those things are really rote. Uh, they're repeatable. You've got you know, maybe your best practices listed on your desk or on the wall for how to go through a process. You know, those are things that, because you've done them so many times before, they can be scripted. They can be programmed. They can be machine automatable pretty fast. Right? So I think it's more, uh, it behooves all of us to kind of look within our own jobs and say, well, what are the things that I'm doing over and over and over again? You know, what are the things that are best practices? Those are things we could probably make more efficient through the use of, of machine learning or through the use of you know, different technology. But then there's all these other tasks that are you know, highly variable. Um, David Otter, who's an economist at MIT, talks about sort of routine and non-routine tasks. Um, and so routine tasks can be, can be both manual or they can be cognitive. Um, routine tasks that are manual are things that robots can maybe do because they're you know, physical. Um, routine cognitive tasks are things that machine learning can probably start doing. But non-routine things, whether they're cognitive, uh, like things you do at work that are highly variable, uh, interfacing with other humans, uh, collaborating with teams, uh, you know, those are things that are not going to go away anytime soon. And then on the on the on the manual side of things, you know, non-routine manual would be, uh, for example, like livestock farming or things that are you know uh, have a high high variability are are things that you know maybe maybe machines uh, maybe robots can get. Some way into you know hydroponic farming indoors because it's highly repeatable. But for things like uh, livestock farming or construction outdoors, you know these are things that are still pretty non-routine. Things that are still generally um, going to be you know done by humans. And so I, I really like the McKinsey study because it really kind of takes this granularity and looks at that. And in overall, what they found was that. Uh, they thought 5% of jobs uh, had 100% of tasks that could eventually, you know, over some period of time, be substituted uh, with machines. And that's, you know, it's still a huge number of jobs that I think beg, you know, real social and, and political questions and all that. Um, but for 60% of jobs, they said 30% of the tasks in those jobs are things that could be substituted over time. So, you know, much more than just sort of this all or nothing, you know, robots are taking over the world, AI is taking over the world. I think it's it's going to look much much more like this gradual progression of, you know, in our cars we've we've had sort of manual to automatic transmissions. We've got park assist. We've got anti lock brakes. We've got all this sort of fly by wire, uh, you know, in our cars and our planes. You know, I think thinking about this more like desktop assist, the, you know, like driver assist, in the sense that we'll have things that say, hey, you know, you're going to send this email out. You're going to post this thing to social media. You're going to do whatever. Um, based on the data that we have, you know, we would suggest you wait 30 minutes. Would you like to delay that post? Would you like to, you know, these, these minor nudges, I think, are, are much more kind of where this is going to impact us on a day-to-day -day basis in the near term. Okay. I love that. So I shouldn't be worried yet. You know, I, Kidding. Yeah, I think uh, 
I think the pendulum needs to swing a little bit back toward, toward hope because I think these tools really have, uh, you know, flipping, flipping the letters around, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence, but I think when you go back to the debates of like the 1950s between Marvin Minsky uh, and J.C.R. Licklider, who I talk about in the book a bit, there was this debate about artificial intelligence and intelligence augmentation and thinking about, you know, if you flip the letters around, uh, how do we make humans more productive? How do we make humans better? I think the Stitch Fix example is a really interesting case for that because a stylist has you know, all these fallibilities, all these uh, you know, biases that are implicit, but can we use machine learning, can we use these things to actually help mitigate those biases and make that person more productive? And that's sort of the intelligence augmentation rather than just the pure AI. One of the themes that I love that you touch on, the attention economy mm -hmm. and that concept um, can you explain that a little bit? And then there's another former Google who's written a lot about this, uh, Tristan Harris, like the sort of ethics of design and yeah. how we have to think about the menu of choices in product design. Yeah, so Trist Tristan Harris, uh, he's, uh, he's a former Googler as well. Uh, he was here, uh, sold his company, it was called Apture, to Google back in, I, I don't know, 2011 or so. Um, became a product manager and then quickly kind of fashioned himself uh, the in-house product philosopher, or one of many. And uh, really took you know this observation, you know, who's in the room as we're making these product decisions? I think in the past we've thought a lot about um, you know who wields uh, massive sort of scale or, or impact of their decisions, you know, and it's very uh, we're it's we're quick to kind of point fingers at you know the MBA at the helm of an investment bank or uh, at the helm of an Enron or a, you know a company that's done something wrong, um, and we you know we forget that today in this sort of digital economy we have this sort of same moral obligation to think about how we're multiplying out effects when we make product decisions that are you know, affecting billions of people. And so Tristan was asking these questions, um, kind of shining a light on you know, what's the diversity of our teams? Who's in the room making product decisions? How are we thinking about not just engagement metrics, not just monetizing via ad revenue, not just uh, you know, the, the sort of key performance indicators that our venture capitalists or our public shareholders want to think about. But if we flip this around and we think about uh, as consumers, as humans, uh, you know, 100 million plus smartphones, uh, 60 to 80 interruptions uh, per day, you start looking at the actual uh, externalities of this uh, from a time perspective, from an interruption with your kids perspective, from a lifestyle perspective, and you know, it, it begs a whole new set of questions. And so um, Tristan basically kind of doesn't have these as, it, as answers, but he's you know, posing these questions. And he left Google recently uh, to start a movement called the Time Well Spent Movement, which looks at this sort of attention economy and how we think about um, these choices that we're making, how we you know, develop the menus, he calls them, uh, within our products. Because you know, we, we're all kind of moving around our world. Uh, you know, if we want to get together to grab a drink uh, after this event, you know, we'll, we'll, chances are, turn to Yelp, or we're we'll turn to OpenTable. We'll turn to a, a product where we're interfacing with a technology layer that has implicit choices of how it surfaces information to us, how it presumes you know, what we want because of our geography or our age or you know, various things that mm -hmm. those uh, product managers, those engineers have, have determined for us. And uh, you know, so these these sorts of questions that, that Tristan poses, I think, are, are really important. You know, as we build our build our teams and think about these things, um, and you know, and, and he gets into some of the some of the sort of philosophy and thinking about how uh, you know Steve Jobs made this comment that the personal computer should be a bicycle for the mind, and Tristan says, you know, wait a minute. Uh, unfortunately, the smartphone in our pocket has, in some ways, become a slot machine. It's become sort of the one finger bandit that steals away our time the same way that uh, you know, one lever bandit uh, from a slot machine kind of takes our money you know, one coin at a time. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's one perspective, uh, but how do we think about this? You know, should there be lead certified uh, you know, like for green buildings? Should there be an FDA? Should there be some sort of um, thinking about uh, how we, as a as society, kind of construct uh, some sort of check and balance on how we want our own personal time to be uh, you know, manipulated in some ways. Um, and really, you know, he doesn't have uh, sort of a, a yes or no answer for any of these things, but says, you know, well, we retain agency as, as personal uh, individuals. You know, we still do that when we walk into Starbucks, but we have calorie menus. We know, you know how many calories in a Frappuccino versus a black coffee. We can still choose whatever we want to choose, um, but should there be those sorts of things baked into our technology that 
allow us as consumers, as users, um, as, as humans, as individuals, uh, to, to be making the choices that we actually want to make with our technology. OK, awesome. Yeah. Um, let's take a step back back towards like the, the overall theme of the book. So you, know, you mentioned, and I think some of us feel in the room too, like folks who, yeah. for me, like political science and history background, um, yeah. looking at the industry that I'm in, uh, not having like a STEM degree, uh, that you know, maybe I don't know how long you know, my career could go in. So can you talk a bit more about your perspective on this and why these skills continue to matter? Yeah. Um, so you know, back to the sort of code, I think it's, it's a multi-part question where um, you know, really, in some ways, the, the chunks of technology have become larger and larger building blocks. And there's a great article in TechCrunch a few years ago about the end of the full stack developer and the rise of the full stack integrator. And I love that, uh, that quote because I think it speaks so much to being able to know where the building blocks are. You know, TensorFlow is this incredible tool. Uh, you don't no longer need to know kind of all the nuances to be able to get a product off the ground or uh, to be able to sort of create an MVP or minimum viable product or create sort of uh, a clickable prototype. Um, so, you know, I think more and more it's about what are, you, what are you passionate about? What's the sort of context to which you want to apply the code? Um, I think, you know, it's, the book is not anti-STEM. It's not anti any of these things. I think you've got to have enough technical literacy, enough, uh, you know, break the ice, uh, be technical enough to be dangerous, which, you know, anyone at Google, I think, has already crossed that line. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's about uh, you know, taking these methodologies, taking these uh, passions, uh, and, and really sort of uh, unlocking these new industries. Like, you know, Mark Andreessen talks a lot about how software is eating the world. Um, but on the flip side, I think software is feeding the world in the sense that now, you know, if you're coming from a background like political science, like, you know, the two of us, yep. um, there's a guy I feature in the book um, named Zach Bookman, and he founded this amazing company called OpenGov. And OpenGov uh, was based on his own sort of personal passion for transparency in government, um, which was rooted in uh, you know, studying political science, going to law school. He worked at the Ninth Circuit uh, in San Francisco on issues around transparency. He went to Mexico looking at transparency issues on a Fulbright. Uh, he went to Afghanistan with General H.R. McMaster to work on transparency issues in Afghanistan. And you know, rather than the proverbial garage, he was living in a container, uh, literally like a shipping container in Kabul. And he had this idea of, you know, wait a minute, we're holding the Afghans to this incredibly high standard of transparency. And you know, do we even have this at home in America? And so he came back, uh, started talking to City Hall in Palo Alto. He thought, you know, this is the heart of Silicon Valley. They must have their ducks in a row. They must have all their data visible and, you know, and digestible. And on the contrary, it was literally in, in boxes, printed out, Excel files. And so they created effectively sort of the mint.com of uh, municipal finance data where you can look and see all of the public expenditures, public revenues um, for 1,000 plus cities. And I think that kind of company, you know, sitting on Sand Hill Road, sitting in a venture capital seat, is so interesting because it's taking technology and applying it meaningfully to this problem that Zach really understood and really had a passion for. And he partnered with uh, Joe Lonsdale, actually, who you know, co-founded Palantir, co-founded a couple other companies um, as a techie. But it was really about this blending of the two sides. And really, the comparative advantage of what got OpenGov off the ground was Zach's passion for transparency, not the sort of ability to create a platform to visualize data. Um, and so I think there's so many examples like that um, that, that really kind of show the way of you know, it's not just people in management positions. Uh, you know, there are plenty of those people, like Susan Wojcicki uh, from YouTube. You know, history and literature major. Uh, you know, or I mentioned Alex Karp from Palantir. You know, neoclassical social theory, or or Steve Case from uh, from AOL is a history major. You know, Emily White, who used to run Instagram and Snapchat, was a studio art and and fine arts major. I mean, so there's so many different examples that I think. Um, you know, it's not just about cherry picking those examples, but thinking about the underlying methodologies of, uh, you know, of, you know, Slack. Uh, Stuart Butterfield, for example, um, was a, both an undergrad and a grad school uh, studied uh, philosophy, and he really attributes kind of product design, product development, to this unlocking of like, you know, kind of this pursuit of truth, where you peel back the onion repeatedly and you go through this process of inquiry, and I think that you know we, we understand the A to A. Um, linearity of you know study engineering become an engineer but we forget that you know study anthropology study sociology 
user experience, uh, study philosophy, you know, product management, product design. There's so many different lines that I think we can draw from these skill sets. If you take a step back and, and sort of uh, you know, don't fall victim to the narrative that these degrees are worthless, that these skills are worthless, because if anything, um, these are the vital components to you know, how we humanize technology, how we actually take technology and make it useful for what it's meant, to, meant for, which is to improve our lives. OK. So if we, we think about kind of like the next generation, um, and you knew I was going to kind of ask you this question because I love the concept of education. Yeah. Um, there's a number of tech billionaires investing in schools, being somewhat directive about sort of like curriculum, mm -hmm. content, things like that. Um, and the New York Times is currently publishing you know, mm -hmm. a series of articles about this. What happens if we take it too far in one direction? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and it's something that's, uh, you know, Steve Jobs talked a number of years back about how the next big uh, platform for innovation was going to be education. Uh, and I think you're starting to see that, whether it's, uh, you know, Rick Levin, the former president of Yale, left Yale to become CEO of Coursera. You know, you think that's, that's not the path that most academics would have foreseen, you know, a few decades ago. Uh, so I think there is this... Um, Understanding that the scale and impact we can have through technology is, is massive, but thinking about how do we engage with the new tools but not lose some of the old ways. And, um, you know, there, there are a bunch of examples. In the New York Times article you mentioned, um, like Mark Benioff has been really sort of engaged in this process. Um, Zuckerberg, through the Ch Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, has invested in a group called uh, Summit Public Schools, which is based mostly here in the Bay Area. Um, but what they've done is they've engaged with technology. So they've used, they use the iPad, uh, for example, um, to deliver lectures, but they create this really personalized experience where the teacher actually has become the coach. So the teacher is uh, you know, kind of walking around the room almost like if you had you know, in soccer practice doing a drill, and the coach is kind of walking around checking in on everybody as they're, as they're performing. Um, but I think that kind of uh, way of engaging with technology, not sort of shunning it, you know, not, you know, I, I talk a little bit about Waldorf schools in the book and sort of taking a completely hands-off approach to tech. But in some ways, I think, um, you know, the, while that's popular in Silicon Valley, you know, we're privileged in the sense that we have tech all around us sure. in our homes, other places. So it's one thing to say, you know, don't deal with tech in the school because, you know, we all work at Google, we all work at Facebook, we all work at these fancy tech companies. That's easy for us to say, but I think for across America, you know, where people don't have that access to technology um, in our schools, like how do we think about, you know, engaging with the tools, um, but doing it in a way that still fosters collaboration, still fosters communication, still builds a lot of these soft skills um, that, are, that are so important. Um, so there's a really interesting example of uh, a guy in India who put computers uh, out in public in New Delhi in the slums. And uh, and, and basically this uh, self-organizing learning environment, he called it a SOL, S-O-L-E, and gave a, a great TED talk about this. And uh, it actually inspired the movie Slumdog Millionaire through this, uh, through this exposure. And uh, in, these, in these souls, basically unleashes technology and lets kids kind of do with it what they want. And the results are really astounding. And so I think um, What's interesting is if you provide the tools uh, and provide sort of a messy question, which is something I talk about in the book, um, these messy questions are things you can't really Google. Um, and they're, they're fun because you know, we, we live in this world where people say, well, you know, all the answers are already on Google, so what's the point? Just give a kid an iPad, they'll, they'll figure it out. Um, actually, you know, this example of messy questions is really fun because you ask things that are ungoogleable, like, you know, why aren't our ears square? Why aren't, uh, you know, so, so it begs the question of, you know, well, how do acoustics work? Uh, how does, you know, how did the ears develop? Maybe it's a, you know, it goes into all these different uh, areas of exploration. And so you show this to, you know, a class of third graders, and they immediately start, you know, Googling all these different things, watching YouTube videos, sure. learning about acoustics, learning about um, different, you know, human biology. Um, but then also sort of the second layer is this collaboration that's happening between them. And, you know, even this tertiary layer of, figuring out what sources they trust, what sources they don't trust. Um, you know, in this sort of Facebook newsfeed world, uh, you know, how are we thinking about uh, you know, red feed and blue feed and what sources we, we choose to trust and, and all that. And I think these are you know, things that are, are really interesting ways that you can engage with the technology, but then um, you know, still sort of teach these underlying skills. It's been a, about a year since you've written the book, and yeah. things move at quite a pace in yeah. the valley and outside as well. Uh, what companies are doing this well? Um, and you know, if you're not a company that's doing well, how do you think about that? 
Well, I think you know we've seen we've seen Uber in the news a lot recently. Um, yeah. I, I'd say you know, from a mm-hmm. cultural standpoint, that's one that I think they probably could figure out a way to, to do better. I think you know Google. I'm biased from having spent so much time here and, and loving the company, but you know I think that Google from you know, back to days as a, as a product specialist here is kind of sitting on core teams where there really are a lot of different people in the room. There are different perspectives. Uh, you know, there's uh, a marketing person, a lawyer. Uh, you know, I was sort of the representative to online sales or direct sales. Um, you know, th- there are all these different people kind of bringing this diversity of perspectives. And I think that sort of uh, modular approach to product development um, I found to be really effective. Um, I know that sort of creating these uh, trusted environments where you can brainstorm openly, like, you know, IDEO does a good job at, at that, um, you know, where you don't judge on the, on the surface. You provide sort of a, an open sharing platform for brainstorming. I think that fosters sort of the trust and the ability to sort of unlock, uh, you know, using social skills and, and all this. Um, but I, it's a good question. I think it's something that, you know, I think through blending these two sides, um, bringing together, you know, fuzzy and techie, again, that it's not sort of a monolith of techie and a monolith sure. of fuzzy, but sort of the two sides. Um, you know, and then from an innovation standpoint, I think uh, there are so many ways that we can be uh, unlocking the problems that we have uh, all across the, you know, all across the country and all across the world and partnering with technologists who are really, you know, know the new tools but are in search of applications for the tools. And so uh, the Defense Department has created, you know, DIUX, which is down the street at Moffett Field. Um, they've done a great job, I think, of taking some of the problems that are really kind of rooted in D.C., rooted in different parts of the State Department, uh, USA, military, um, and brought them out to Silicon Valley and said, you know, here's what we're struggling with. Here are the problems that we have. You know, are there ways we can engage with technology uh, to, to help fix these? Um, and Steve Blank, who's an entrepreneurship professor mm-hmm. at, at Stanford and Berkeley and at Columbia sometimes as well, um, he's created a class that's uh, it's called Hack for Defense and another one called Hack for Diplomacy. And it basically takes a mixture of political scientists, uh, people from different sort of fuzzy backgrounds, and engineering students and pairs them on teams and puts them against one of these problems that's sourced by a different agency. Um, I think it's a really great example of, you know, how we can take, uh, you know, fuzzy and techie, how we can take sort of this uh, problem-centric approach, um, you know, rather than just building technology in the abstract and then looking for some way to, to apply it. I have a question just kind of in regards to, like, the education piece again. Um, I went to a college that was, had, like, a big core curriculum where I took, like, a lot of liberal arts things. I had to take, like, art class and a music class. And some of kind of the benefit I feel like you're talking about with, with the fuzzy comes from having this innate subject matter expertise or this deep knowledge of something that they're curious about. I was wondering, as you look at education moving forward, is there still a place for this kind of general core curriculum or a base level of knowledge you need to have? Or do you really think it comes down to just letting somebody pursue what they're interested in and just going as deep as possible in that direction? Yeah, it's a great, great question. Um, actually, yesterday I sat down with the, the vice provost of undergraduate education at, at Stanford. And we were talking about this metaphor. He's talked to a bunch of students that treat their, they call them ballistic students, where they, they're, they're good you know, at, at getting where they want to get. And they're you know, on this trajectory of, I'm trying to get to this you know, from point A to point B, and I don't want to see anything in between. I know how to execute along that vector, and I'm going. Um, and he said, you know, rather than treating your education like a plane ticket, where you, know, you get from here to Frankfurt, what do you do with the plane ticket? You, know, you throw it in the trash can. Now you're in Frankfurt. Um, how do you think about this in terms of, uh, you know, kind of tugging on the mind and getting a breadth of exposure to different ideas? And he had this uh, notion of, of education as a passport. And it's a passport that's infinitely renewable, that you want to get stamps from all over the world. And you really want to collect stamps from things that kind of push your boundaries. You know, so if you spend a lot of time in Europe, you want to go to Asia. If you spend a lot of time in Asia, you want to go to Africa. And sort of how do you... Uh, create this uh, metaphor and how do you get students to think about their education not as a plane ticket to point B, which is a job as a product manager at a fancy tech company, um, but how do you, you know, how do you think about developing this holistic skill set, being able to, you know, explore different disciplines, different genres, and I think that's the only way that you really unlock passion and true interest, and, uh, you know, and that's really what makes uh, technology useful and, and applicable is, is somebody that's taking the new tools and, and putting them in, in the context of something that they, that they love. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a f- firm believer in sort of the broad 
education. And I think if you listen to you know, some of the things Mark Cuban's been saying recently, um, some of the things that Jonathan Rosenberg here at Google has been saying recently uh, about the value of liberal arts in addition to STEM. You know, it's like we've got to become technical enough to be dangerous, uh, to use the new tools, to be conversant with data, to be conversant with uh, you know, these, these new things, um, but not losing sight of uh, the breadth of exposure that makes it all useful to begin with. And so um, you know, the li liberal arts, the kind of second deck of the book, you know, why the liberal arts will rule the digital world, it's really kind of ab about exactly what you're getting at is uh, you know, this, this breadth of exposure and how we apply tech meaningfully to all these different areas of, of our lives. Um, you know, and, then, and then the second kind of component to that gets back to the question of, of automation, where you know, if we have these uh, simple parts of our jobs, parts of our lives that are automated away, which probably will be over time, um, you know, what's left are the complex tasks, and what's left are the tasks where we, you know, we, we trade tasks more uh, frequently. You're good at one thing, I'm good at something else. And um, there's a guy at Harvard Graduate School of Education who talks about um, the importance of soft skills. And he, he puts it in the terms of, of trade, almost like an economic argument, where when there's a lot of trade, there's a lot of transaction costs or friction. And the thing that reduces friction, that reduces transaction costs, that makes teams more effective, are these uh, social skills. So how do you train for that? And I think you know, one way you train for that is through real like, breadth of exposure, Socratic methodology, debating in class, debating at night, um, and I think if you're just on this plane ticket, you know, one-way plane ticket, you're not getting that. So I love the passport, sort of uh, that metaphor. Mm -hmm. So you talk about how um, people see like the fuzzy and the techie as separate things, but truly to kind of the way we're kind of moving toward is kind of seeing how they both interact. Um, but I guess I'm just graduate of college or I'm a year out, but it seems like in these big companies like Google or Uber or Snapchat, to get into product or to get into the techie side of things, you do have to have a techie prerequisite. Mm -hmm. So kind of how do you give advice, I guess, to someone like me who's trying to see, to blend that fuzzy and techie mm -hmm. to get to be, you know, in the product side or, or development of, of certain products at a company? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, and I think um, it's true, you know, at Google to, to be on the product team, there is a requirement in some way, shape or form of being able to, to to deal with technology, uh, you know, in a rigorous in a rigorous way, um, but there are so many examples, like Snapchat, for example. Um, one of the core people behind a lot of the product innovation is a sociologist, and I talk about him a little bit in the book. Um, his name is Nathan Jurgensen, and he's based in Brooklyn. He did a did a PhD in sociology and was basically writing about where he thought Snap was going, why he thought it was relevant, and it's I think it's a fascinating case uh, in my in, from my seat. You know, why did Snapchat take off? Um, you know, yet to see if it's truly successful. I mean, I think it's proven to be somewhat successful, at least went public, which is more than we can say for Uber and others. Um, but, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, given Instagram, given, you know, Google+, given Facebook, given all these different platforms that were out there already, um, you know, why did Snap, why was it able to break into the market? And really, I think the underlying reason why goes back to Nathan's insights uh, as a sociologist in observing sort of these Gen Zers who had grown up in a world of digital abundance, in a world where every photo they'd ever taken was in their Dropbox or their Google you know, Drive, uh, saved infinitely forever. And he said, how do you create scarcity in a world of digital abundance? You do it by making things disappear. And it was this like core uh, understanding, I think, of the sociological insight that I think really gave them uh, an advantage. And Evan Spiegel read some of these posts and immediately hired uh, Nathan, brought him into Snap, um, and now he's an instrumental part of kind of the product organization. Um, similarly, I would point to Snap Spectacles versus Google Glass. I think that the insight with Snap Spectacles is that there is uh, a difference between clear glasses and, and sunglasses worn indoors versus worn outdoors. I think it's like a techie-only approach versus sort of a, a fashion-forward approach of, of looking at the sociological insights of how people, where people want to wear glasses, what the inherent assumptions of trust are. I think with sunglasses, you know, there's, there's already this lack of trust because you can't see someone's eyes. If they're recording, if they're posting, if it's done outdoors, it's very different than if you're sitting in someone's living room and you think that you're just having a, a private conversation and suddenly it's being recorded. Um, so those small sociological insights, I think, are really at the core of what makes a lot of these you know, products work versus another. Um, so I think if you can form a thesis, if you can sort of be vocal about 
um, you know, having an opinion of where you see the market going and sort of owning that, that opinion and, and providing that uh, perspective to a product manager or to you know, a product that you think is interesting. Um, you know, I think that's something that people will find valuable and they'll probably bring you in on a project basis or bring you in in a consultative capacity and then over time, you know, that can really snowball into a lot of different um, interesting opportunities. And, um, I was just kind of wondering, you know, I, I think when you think about like models and machine learning, I think like probably the biggest risk is like, like you said, the human input part, like not putting enough thought into what those inputs are and then your results can kind of be skewed. While like I, I think you know there is definitely a place for people who are like pure, like you know fuzzy if you will, mm -hmm. like is there danger in not being able to kind of look under the hood and understand what's going on, what those inputs actually are in those models when we think about like ten fifteen years from now, when our tasks are being automated even for the roles we're doing today? Yeah, I think I mean it's a real it's a real question about you know, black box. Uh, you know, I think it's. It's something that we're going to be grappling with uh, for a long time. I mean, you read you read an econ paper and you ask the author of the econ paper, you know, why did you assume this, this, and this? You know, that's that. Those are just words, and people can barely describe their assumptions and why they chose one thing versus another. And now we're talking about you know thousands of lines of code, things baked into algorithms, things pushed out into ones and zeros, um, built by composite teams across the world. You know, and and I think that there are these very real questions of of bias and who's in the room and who's helping make those decisions. Um, but I do think we need you know, pure fuzzies in those, in those scenarios as well, because um, you know, if you look at predictive policing as one example, um, you know, there's so many things we could probably do with predictive anal analytics around you know, IoT sensors on police vehicles saying, OK, where are they going? Where are they at certain times of day? Where is reported crime? How do we think about deploying police force in advance to you know, mitigate crime? And that seems all nice and harmless, but behind the scenes, you say, well, OK, actually, reported cri crime data is reported crime data. Reported crime data comes from who has trust in community, who feels uh, acceptable uh, to, to report crime. If somebody has a dozen unpaid parking tickets, they're probably not calling the cop for, for petty theft. Uh, you know, uh, certain crimes, like hate crimes uh, and, and sexual assault, are chronically, re chronically underreported. Um, you know, on, on the flip side, the sort of arbitrary nature of, you know, if you sit at one intersection and you watch how many people run red lights, over time, the reported crime data of running red lights in that intersection will be very high. Um, you might think that people are disproportionately running red lights at that intersection, but that just may be uh, sort of a fallacy in, in how the data was collected. Um, so I think these questions behind the scenes of, you know, if you had a, a social worker in the room talking about um, details of how crime statistics are reported, uh, you know, that's a really important component to have in the room if you're about to deploy predictive policing you know, for Oakland PD or something. And so I, I, do, I think you, you ask a really important question that we need to be thinking about. And I don't have a good answer, but um, you know, really kind of involving a plurality of people, diverse backgrounds. Um, Fei-Fei Li, who now runs you know, Google Cloud's uh, machine learning and AI, um, was at Stanford before. Uh, you know, she's created a nonprofit called AI for All that's about bringing women into AI, bringing different ethnicities into AI, different academic backgrounds into AI. And I think those sorts of initiatives are, are really important um, to sort of get those perspectives from the ground floor and how we're thinking about these things. Because just because you know, we pump it into ones and zeros and call it an AI, call it uh, you know, machine learning, call it whatever we want, you know, doesn't make it objective. It still has all these implicit assumptions and biases that are you know, made by humans. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tyler Cowen, I think it is, but he, he runs the blog um, Marginal Revolution. Uh -huh. um, but anyway, his vision of the future is basically that there are these technical superstars who become sort of like the capitalist class, and they design the sort of Ubers for everyone else to use. But without that skill set, it's sort of hard to become a value producer in society. And sort of using your example of the company, I think it's Stitchist or something, um, where you know the number of fuzzies just far um, outweighed the number of, t of of like the small number of sort of elite mm -hmm. data scientists mm -hmm. techies. How do you sort of deal with the question of uh, these these techies or like the is there is there going to be a big inequality in terms of earning potential for people for fuzzies and and, and sort of also 
how do you how do you go about as a company like quantifying and valuing the impact of fuzzies because it seems like something that's much less tangible yeah i mean it's the questions of inequality and there's another great book that i would recommend um i just picked up its translation from dutch um but it's called uh utopia for realists and it's it's by a dutch author um that goes into the questions of basic income and, and some of these some of these ideas um that's Really interesting. I mean, on the flip side of that question, I think, is the democratization of the toolkits and the tensor flows of the world, the, the way that you can kind of, you know, being a full stack integrator, more and more people with less and less uh, kind of quote, you know, technical ac expertise can actually put these tools to use in incredible ways. Um, you know, and from the Google blog, actually, uh, one example in the book is about a Japanese farmer that uses like Arduino and uses TensorFlow and took 3,000 images of, uh, of different cucumbers that he has on his farm and created a classification engine to basically auto-sort all of his cucumbers. So he created a you know, robotic system uh, to completely automate his, his farming uh, routine. And so I think we'll equally see that sort of thing happening. Um, you know, to the question of inequality, I, th I think that's a big, it's a big question um, that, that we all need to, to grapple with. But, um, the reality is that you know if you have a degree in you know one thing versus another and it's a slip of paper from a university, uh, it's not a carte blanche relevance regardless of what it says. You know whether it says computer science or anthropology. Um, what's really interesting example in the book is uh, Zach Sims when he founded uh, Code Academy. He dropped out as a political science major. He went to MIT and Harvard to try to hire all the people to build Code Academy, and none of them had the requisite coding skills that he actually needed. And so he said to all of them, you know, you need to go upskill, you need to go to General Assembly, you need to go to some of these platforms to learn the relevant skills. And I think it's case in point for, we all have to kind of keep our education in beta. We've all got to continually sort of break the ice and continue to learn. Um, because realistically, if you're coming out of uh, university in 2017, I mean, who knows what the job market in 2060 looks like? You know, anybody that speculates has no idea. So I think the reality is we've got to kind of keep education in beta continually reinvest in ourselves, uh, you know, try to be technical enough to be dangerous and not forget uh, you know, some of these other methodologies as well. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And let's once again give a thank you to, to Scott Hartley. Thanks so much, Thanks, guys. Thanks,